In today's show, the NBA draft lottery has been done. It has been run. It has been won by the San Antonio Spurs. So we're going to do our first mock draft. Oh, yeah. We know where Wemby's going. Let's go, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. Draft lottery is done. We'll go through the results and I will do my first draft for the 2023 NBA draft. Now, this is the beginning, really, of my view into the draft. I have been working on it. I've done so many fantasy translations and looking at numbers and watching film. But over the next 38 days, I think it is, until the NBA draft, we're going to have tons of draft analysts on. I'm going to go through more information, look at more film, look at all a whole bunch of different things, and my opinions on this will change. So this is the first mock draft. We'll probably end up with five of them, I reckon, on the channel and go through how things change. So bear that in mind. Also bear in mind that if I do something that's different to uh, consensus or to what you think, it doesn't mean I'm right. It doesn't mean you're right. Who knows? People are wrong with stuff all the time. This is sort of how I view things under the lens of the team, the player, the state of the NBA, the value of these guys, all of that sort of stuff. So... You will see some things that differ from consensus here, but that's the fun of it. And this is going to differ from the mock draft I do in two weeks and in four weeks and in five weeks. So, warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. (laughs) This is not going to change, though. Pick number one, which is going to the San Antonio Spurs, is Victor Wembanyama. That, there's no doubt about this. This is not changing. They are not trading the pick. None of this stuff is happening. He is the number one pick. He will go number one to the Spurs. He will start from day one. Um, people will wonder, I guess, does this impact Zach Collins? Probably a little bit. Does it impact Jeremy Sohan? Probably a little bit. Because he's going to start over one of those two guys. Now, we know that Popovich a few weeks ago went out and said, yeah, Zach Collins is our starting center next season. And he very well might be. That would mean that Wembenyama would start at the four. Sohan can start at the three. But then you've got Keldon Johnson and Devin Vassell. Now, none of these guys are awesome prospects or awesome players. But somebody is going to miss out there. On that team. Now, trades could happen, all that sort of stuff. Their big real need, I thought, was point guard. They're not going to take a point guard here. So somebody, Vassell, Calden, Sohan, Collins, is going to move to the bench almost undoubtedly. It probably will end up being... Who will it probably end up being? If it was me, it would be Calden Johnson. But it's not me. I think it probably will end up being... Actually, I don't even know. It's probably Zach Collins, but I don't think that you want to start... Wimanyama at center. So that would be so hard, but he's obviously a highly... Pro- I don't know. I need to think more about it, but it doesn't matter. You don't overthink it. You're taking um, Wemby at number one. Pick two. It's Scoot Henderson. Now the Hornets have a very weird roster now. He is to me very clearly, I think the second best prospect in this draft, Scoot. He's only 6'2", I know that, but he's a 6'9 wingspan player. He's got some room to grow with his shooting, but I don't think you overthink. You don't look at it and go, well, we've got Lamello. We've got Terry Rozier, so we don't take Scoot Henderson. And there can be some defensive iffiness between Scoot and Lamello. But all this means to me is that you you definitely look to ship out Terry Rozier at some point coming up really soon. It obviously really hurts any sort of upside that Dennis Smith had. He doesn't really have that much upside anyway. But you take Scoot and you're playing with Lamello. They both do need the ball in their hands. You're going to have a lot of staggering going on here. I would expect Scoot to play... Lower than usual rookie minutes. It's Steve Clifford, for example. And you've got another capable ball handler in Lamello. And I do think that Rogier will be traded in the next couple of months. That would be my guess. That's what I'd be looking to do if I was the Hornets. But they do take him. I know a lot of people go, well, Josh, they just they need a forward. They need to replace Gordon Haywood. So they'd take Brandon Miller here. I just don't think you approach the draft that way. And to me, there's a sizable gap between Scoot and Brandon Miller that I don't care to do that. They still do likely have Miles Bridges coming back. There's PJ Washington's restricted free agency. Gordon Haywood's around. He will likely be moved as well. But I don't think you reach ahead for You're not in a position to reach ahead to grab a guy who I think is not as good of a player. You just take Scoot 
and you figure it out. Like Scoop might be better than Lamelo. So in the end, you move Lamelo if that ends up being the case and they don't work together. I'm not saying that's the case, but you just take Scoot. Pick three. At the moment, it's Portland. It will not remain Portland. I'm really confident that it will not remain Portland. So a team, Brooklyn, Toronto, Philadelphia, Boston, um, I don't know who else it could be. They might be getting the rights to pick three, Anthony Simons, other draft picks. Even if they didn't, so let's say, for example, that Portland kept this pick. I think Amon Thompson makes sense for the Blazers. He's a guy that can work with Shaden Sharp. He could work with Simons. He can work with Lillard. There is so much to know about these OTE prospects and how the stats translate. But this is a six foot seven guy with unbelievable athleticism, top 10 athleticism in the NBA already, probably. Great vision. Shooting is a problem, but unbelievable defense, great character, all that sort of stuff. So I, I think he's a better player than Brandon Miller at this point, but I could be swayed on that one. But in the end, it's not going to be, I don't think, it's not going to be Portland picking in this position. So the Blazers moved up from five up to three, and they will probably not end up with this pick. Pick four is the Houston Rockets. They slid down to four. I think this is a no brand. Now, I'm not compl- I am not completely sold on Brandon Miller at all. Um, but I would take him at pick four here for the Rockets. They were starting KJ Martin at the three. There's a perfect slot in opportunity. Obviously, this hurts Tari Eason quite a little bit as well. It hurts KJ Martin, clearly. Miller's a guy that doesn't have to be super high usage. I worry that he might slide into the Jabari Smith. We don't run plays necessarily for you sort of player as a rookie when Jalen Green and Kevin Porter are still out there. Um, I am not sure that Miller will even end up four on my board at the end. There are other guys coming after this that I do really like. And to me, there's very much a, a Victor tier. There's a Scoot tier. Then there probably is an Armin tier. And then there's about a six bloke tier coming after this. And Miller's in that, so he could move around. I think really, really comfortably. Other teams could look into it. I'm not sold on him. His inability to um, finish at the rim or get to the rim that much is a, is a problem, I think. Um, And we'll see where it goes. But at the moment, I do have him at pick number four. Today's episode is brought to you by a new sponsor, and that is Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs are just comfortable clothes, comfortable pants, comfortable shorts. They fit great. I love them. I love my Bird Dogs. I love how comfortable they are. I love the way that I can put them on and just know, hey, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to look good. But I'm going to feel great when I do it as well. I can use it for anything. I can go to the supermarket. I can go out for dinner. I can go visit friends. I can go out, whatever I need to do. My bird dogs are always going to be there for me. If you go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA, you can use our promo code locked on NBA and you get a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. They've got the stretchy fabric, makes my legs bulge, looks sexy. That's what everyone wants, isn't it? They're comfier than all my other shorts, all my other pants. I, I reach straight away. As soon as they get dirty, I go, man, I've got to wash them now. Get them straight out, put them straight back on. Love the feel of my bird dogs. So, Go again, birddogs.com, Locked On NBA. Enter the promo code Locked On NBA and get yourself that free Yeti style tumbler with every order. Bird Dogs, get them. You're going to love them. How much are these teams going to love their picks coming up? We will find out. At pick five, it is the Detroit Pistons who fell in this draft. To me, I am higher on this player than a lot of other guys. If you are watching this on YouTube, I've got a lot of bunch of stats up for these guys. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the stats and all that sort of stuff. But if you are watching this, and I'll bring the screen across now, if you see that draft range, it's what I have done with a cumul... I've got like about 10 or 12 big boards and mock drafts that I'm getting the ADP data from. And this is the range, the highest versus the lowest. I know I'm... For those of you on um, audio, I'm like keeping that a little bit to myself as to who this player is. But at number five, I am taking Taylor Hendricks out of UCF, an athletic power forward who can shoot, who is 6'9", who can move, who can defend, who's got good defensive numbers, good shooting numbers, solid usage numbers, fits perfectly on this team. I wouldn't be shocked if in the end of my analysis, he moves up to four. I'm really, or he might move to eight. So many of these guys together, he's in the same tier as Brandon Miller to me. Hendricks at 12 on certain people's boards is way too low in my opinion. I just think that that versatile forward who can shoot and can defend 
a lot of his numbers when I did some comparisons in college came out very similar to Robert Covington's college numbers, but he did it as a freshman. Covington did it as a senior. And we know how impactful Covington was as a, you know, look, if you get picking a pick five and get Robert Covington, you're probably not super happy, but I think he's got way more upside than that. He's still he's super young. Um, and that, that's the thing with this draft class as well when we're talking fantasy and dynasty is that nearly every pick that we're going to be looking at here is a 19 or 20 year old. Nearly everyone's 19. And when we do fantasy translations for rookies, a lot of the time, some of the top guys end up, Benedict Matherin, Jaden Ivey, like, oh, they came out as like a 300th best player. And that's, you know, then if they played 30 minutes a night and then they you know, end up in 200th or 190th. This year, every player that seems to come out translates at 130, which is so, so big. It's so big. There are 18 top 10 talents in this draft, I think. And the other thing we talk about is like, oh, well, this best player looks like he's a center or he's a guard that doesn't do much. In this year's draft, it's like, oh, all of these guys are wings. They are forwards who uh, who can defend and who have got size. And that's it. There's hardly any centers. There's not many point guards. It's wings. And that's what the NBA runs on. And that's why it's so exciting, this draft. So I've got Taylor Hendricks at number five. At number six, going to your Orlando Magic. I'm going to take the other Thompson, and that's Asar Thompson. I think he's just a slightly worse athlete than Amen. I think he's probably a better shooter, maybe a little bit less vision. It's really close. I think he probably is going to be a better shooter than Amen. Amen is not a great shooter, neither is Asar. And that's going to hold those guys back. And I still don't really know how to process all the overtime elite numbers because even if you look at this, look at these numbers. These are all these key stats, by the way, per 36 minutes. 3.5 steals and 1.8 blocks for Asar Thompson per 36 minutes. They are insane numbers. Now, it's... A lot of it's not real because of the competition level. And he and his brother are two of the older players. It's him. Uh, it's the two Thompsons and Brandon Miller who are 20. And nearly everyone else we're talking about is going to be 19. So they are like a full year older than a lot of these guys. And that is a little bit of a ding. But I do have Asar Thompson going at number six to the Magic. Size. could How does that work next to Markel Fultz? <laughs> I don't know about that one. But another long player, unbelievable defender that would make things really tough for Jalen Suggs and Cole Anthony on that team. Um, and the shooting would be a problem, but I do like him there. I could easily see the next guy going to Orlando, but that does create a real problem, logjam problem. I could also see this guy going at number four. I could very easily see Cam Whitmore being better than Brandon Miller. He's in the same tier. I've got him at seven to the Pacers, and the Pacers love this spot. Now, they would love to be top two, top one. They would love all those spots, but they don't have forwards, and there is a million forwards here, so they could get... Asar Thompson, who's not really a forward, he's a guard, but sure. They could end up with the Brandon Miller, who I don't think would slide, but they could get Taylor Hendricks. They could get Jarris Walker, but I'm going to give him Cam Whitmore, who I, obviously the assist to turnover ratio is really bad for him, but he's super young. He's not even 19. He's big. He's strong. Good usage player at Villanova. Um, probably didn't need to do much with passing. They just wanted him to do everything scoring-wise. Shot the ball okay, not fantastic. I really think that, again, this is the player. The 6'7", six, 6'8", six, forward who can generate his own shot, who can be like a self-creator, not necessarily a creator for others. Like these are all unbelievably good and interesting players. I think a higher usage upside than, than a Brandon Miller. Not necessarily making him a better player because Miller's obviously an elite shooter. But this sort of prospect is just perfect. India's going to have their choice of a million perfect prospects for what their team needs. And it's awesome. They're going to be in a large role immediately. At pick eight... Now, the Wizards team, there's a lot of flux with this squad. Does Kuzma come back? Does Porzingis come back? I don't know. But instead of overpaying Kyle Kuzma, why don't you just draft Jarris Walker? That's what I would do. And again, I'm for a team that's just nothing, which the Wizards tend to be a lot of the time, just take who you think the best player is. Now, you might not think Jarris Walker is the best player. And this team doesn't have a GM in place, and they might say, well, we really need a point guard, so let's reach up and take Anthony Black or Kaysen Wallace. To me, this is sort of where this tier ends, at number eight with Jarris. So I'll take Jarris Walker. But I can't rule anything out with this team and what they do at point guard. And they could take one of the... Because my next two players are going to be point guard type guys. So I would definitely take Jarris, who is a big, strong, powerful... Probably can't play the three. Really good defensively. Showed a little bit of growth in his shooting. 35% from three. Not as high usage upside, I don't think, as Whitmore, obviously, or even a Taylor Hendricks. But a really strong, really good defender. And you know, that... By pairing him with Porzingis, pairing him with Denny Avdia if Kuzma moves on, but also enabling you not to overpay Kyle Kuzma, if that is the choice. 
I think really works. Now, if they keep, if they retain Porzingis, they retain Kuzma, then Walker's role might be relatively limited early on. But this is the direction I would go pretty, pretty comfortably, I think. That's the end of that first tier. But again, that, or not the first tier, third tier. That tier of Amon, who I do think is probably like in a half tier above, but then it's Miller, it's Whitmore, it's Hendricks, and it's Walker in a pretty close group tier, I think. So I've got uh, Jarris Walker coming in at number eight. The Utah Jazz are going to take Kaysen Wallace, guard out of Kentucky. Offensively, there are some limitations. Low usage player, which is a little bit of a red flag, under 20 usage, 13 points, but he's 6'4", he's got size, he fits a positional need, he's a great defender. Kentucky guards often show big improvements in their offensive game heading out of Kentucky. I could have gone with another point guard here who was Anthony Black, but I think Wallace's Kentucky pedigree, his defensive acumen, um, you know, shooting is probably a little bit better than Black. Defensively, I guess you could debate who's better. But I think getting Case in here with that little bit of baked-in Kentucky upside is what I would do at pick nine. So Case and Wallace at pick nine to the Utah Jazz. And that brings us to number 10, which is the Dallas Mavericks. They kept their pick. They didn't have to send it to the Knicks. And I am going to take Anthony Black out of Arkansas. Um, Black could be argued, and I saw someone say he's maybe one of the best defensive prospects they've ever viewed as a, as a wing guard player. That's awesome. The shooting is a little bit of a problem for him, but he's huge. He's 6'7", point guard type of player. Really good defensive numbers. 21 usage, good steals, 55 true shooting. Really good size. And we know that the Mavericks, like Luka's their point guard and Kyrie is there, but getting other players, Jalen Brunson, the way that they had those secondary ball handlers, they need them. And with the size that Black has, enables him to switch up and down the lineup. Who knows what Kyrie's future is? And even if Kyrie's future is in Dallas, Kyrie's 31. So you're not relying upon him forever. And Black can come in and, and run the second unit. Probably wouldn't be a big minute guy if he ended up in Dallas. I wouldn't think straight away. But a Black, Doncic, Hardy, future, one, two, three combination. I think that works. And his defensive ability for a team that's one of the worst defensive teams in the NBA. I would like that. Now, pick number 11. It is the Orlando Magic getting the Bulls pick. Bulls, you don't get a pick, sorry. Um, I'm going to go to Baylor. And I'm going to take Keontae George, who is a basically a one-position player. He's a shooting guard. Maybe you could say he's a point guard. He can do a little bit of ball handling. They went at pick six with Asar Thompson, who is a bigger player, 6'7", who's more of an athlete, bigger ball handler type, whereas George is a shooter, uh, an off-ball sort of shooting guard guy with a little bit of creation ability there. Huge usage at Baylor, 31%. Um, this is probably, uh, the draft range I've seen is 12 to 18 for him. And I would have had him probably a little bit low, but the Magic getting pick 11 makes me more interested in taking him here. I just think that, that um, their, their guard depth can be a little bit of a, an issue in terms of how does Suggs and Fultz, and in this case, Asar and Cole Anthony all work together. We know their forward situation is pretty settled. But George, maybe if he ends up just being a backup guard, which at pick 12, fair enough. I think works out okay. But again, this is a likely top 10 player in most drafts. But Keontae George coming down here to number 11 in this one. Could be a wild card here, but number 12. I know play, people have had him higher than this, but I'm going to take GG Jackson at number 12 to the Thunder. GG is unbelievably young. He might be the youngest player in this draft class. He's 18. He doesn't turn 19 until December. He's a small forward, power forward type. He's six foot nine out of South Carolina. Unbelievably high usage, highly inefficient. Weird team, weird scenario, weird immaturity issues for GG with you know, Instagram lives and slagging off coaches. Going to the Thunder, though, on this team where he can play next to Chet, next to Shea, next to Giddy, next to Jalen Williams, the Bronco. The upside that this guy possesses, uh, defensively, he had some struggles, but I think he's got something there. There is, there is a lot to like here with GG. And I know my colleague, Raf Barlow, at Locked On NBA Big Board, has him at number five. That's how high he is. And there are people, as you can see, that draft range, got him at 27. I'm big on, on taking this swing on GG. Really, as you say, everyone is really young. Every player is young here. We haven't had anyone over 20 and a half, which is Brandon Miller, the oldest player we've looked at. Everyone is young. Everyone has really big upside. This is likely a top 10, top nine player in most drafts again. But I'm going to take GG Jackson at number 12. Number 13 is the Raptors. I'm going to go with Bryce Sensibor. Unbelievably high usage at a higher state, 34% usage. 
He shot 40% from three. He's a 6'6", shooting guard, small forward. He can shoot. The Raptors don't have guards and they don't have players that can shoot. And they're probably going to lose Gary Trent. Center board might have a solid role straight away on this team. He's 6'6", so he's not quite 6'9", but he's 6'6", so he's not small. There are issues with passing and defense and all that sort of stuff, but just getting someone who can shoot and be an offensive sort of a guy, I think makes a lot of sense. His range is you know, wild wild as well. It's pretty wide, 9 to 27 draft range. I've got Sensible at pick 13 going to the Toronto Raptors. And my last lottery pick, I am going to do the rest of the first round. My last lottery pick is the New Orleans Pelicans at number 14. And we're going to take Grady Dick, the wing from Kansas. Again, 19, six foot seven. See a pattern here? 40% three-point shooter. I, To me, he's probably the most likely out of this top 14 to drop out of it. I, I like him as a shooter, but I also am getting like uh, Corey Kispert PTSD. Like, what else do you do? Now, he's granted he's three years younger than Corey Kispin. I think he's probably got a little bit more upside to handle and dribble. But in the end, like I think there's some other guys behind him, and we're going to talk about them in a second, who could very easily shoot ahead of Grady Dick, even though the, the value of him and having that sort of a shooter on this team to pair like with Trey Murphy around Zion, around Ingram, around Herb Jones... Look, and I could make an argument that could take a center here, but the center, the only center who's really available, Derek Lively, can't shoot at all, and that doesn't make sense with Zion either. So I think taking Grady Dick here, just getting a shooter in, I'm not convinced on it. I think I'll end up dropping Grady down from here, but other people have got him high. Like, his draft range is 9 to 12. I'm lower on him than nearly everybody. Nearly everybody that I've looked at anyway. So I've got him at 14, and I, I can actually see going a little bit lower here than uh, Grady Dick. All right, so to recap my lottery, which we'll go into the rest of the picks in a second. Number one, Weminyama to the Spurs. Number two, Scoot Henderson to the Hornets. Number three, Amon Thompson to the Blazers, which won't stay there. Brandon Miller to the Rockets at four. Taylor Hendricks to the Pistons at five. Asar Thompson to the Magic at six. Cam Whitmore to the Pacers at seven. Jarris Walker to the Wizards at eight. Kaysen Wallace to the Jazz at nine. Anthony Black to the Mavericks at 10. Keontae George to the Magic at 11. GG Jackson to the Thunder at 12. Bryce Sensibor to the Raptors at number 13. And at 14, we had Grady Dick going to the Pelicans. So let's get into the rest of the draft. To pick number 15, it is the Atlanta Hawks. And I'm going to take Leonard Miller, a guy that had a real chance as an 18-year-old to be drafted last season in the 20s. Um, went back into the draft. He's a 6'10 forward who's got some shooting upside, but he's athletic. He's a great finisher. Um... You know, on this team, there's Jalen Johnson as a young forward upside player. I think Miller at 6'10 can play the three. And I wouldn't say DeAndre Hunter's locked in as the long-term star there. And having a Miller, Johnson, Griffin, two through four combination in the future with a lot of versatility there makes quite a bit of sense to me. We're going to run through a lot of these ones now a little bit quicker just because you know, we've got a lot of picks to go through still. So let's talk about number 16, which is the Utah Jazz. I'm going to take Derek Whitehead. Wing out of Duke, another 18-year-old. He's still not 19. 6'6", 43% shooting from three. Good usage. The problem with Derek, who could easily be in the 30s, could be in the 20s, could be in the in the like top 12, but he had another surgery on a foot. He had a foot issue during the season. He had another surgery on it. The fact that he still averaged 14 points, shooting 43%, on 22 usage with a foot problem all season is not a red flag to me. It's a green flag. Now, multiple foot injuries is a red flag, but the fact doing this on a broken foot or a foot issue is is great. I love that he was able to do it. My problem is what if he loses some athleticism, which is always a little bit of a concern for Derek. But that shooting, the wing size, again, look, you see the pattern, guys. These are all wings and forwards, basically. And they're all big. They can all shoot a little bit and defend a little bit. It's a great class of players. This is an interesting one. At pick 17, it is the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, this could change according to, you know, um, trades and all that sort of stuff. But at the moment, we're going to go Lakers at 17. And I'm going to take Nick Smith Jr., who came into this season as maybe the number one college recruit. I think he was. Played at Arkansas and, and really struggled. Now, a lot of these players who come in as top high school recruits and struggle in college never turn it around. Scully Bissier is not even in the league anymore. Nasir Little, Cam Reddish. They just don't, they don't know how to do it. They don't figure it out. It's very... While we can look at this and go, well, let's bank on the upside of the high caliber high school recruit, 
I can't, and maybe there's an example and you can let me know if there is. I can't think of one who turned around a bad college season after being a top three high school guy, top five high school guy, and became a really strong NBA player. Can Smith do that? I don't know. He still averaged 17 points, but the efficiency was horrendous. 47% true shooting. It defensively, yeah, whatever, but good usage. Played alongside Anthony Black, so I guess some of his ball handling stuff wasn't quite there. But just, there is talent here. And again, this is when I say there's 18 top 10 type players, like Nick Smith's probably a top 10 sort of player. Would you take you know, Nick Smith over Davion Mitchell from two years ago, who went at number nine? Yeah, I would very easily. So it's all really relative. So him going to 17 doesn't mean that he's that bad. There's still a bit there. And obviously he disappointed last season. There's no, no denying that. At number 18, the Miami Heat. I'm going to go to Michigan. And I'm going to take one of their two first round likely picks. And that's Kobe Bufkin. Left-handed guard, again, 19. Six for four. He's got a big range, 10 to 26. People love him. 36% shooting. He's really rising up the boards at the moment. Very similar to the way the Bronco Jalen Williams did last season. 58% true shooting, 36% from three. Can pass, can shoot, can score. This is a team with you know, Gabe Vincent and, and Max Struess, Tyler Hero, Kyle Lowry, probably not going to be around forever. Obviously, he's 36. Um, can Buff can be a starting point guard? Probably not. But... Could he be a starting guard next to a Tyler Hero and they're both sort of combo guards? Maybe, I don't know. There's enough here, there's enough upside that the Heat would take that crack at it and try and develop him. At pick 19, this is one of the most interesting players for fantasy managers and that's Derek Lively the second from Duke. 19, again, seven foot one, but one of the, basically the Walker Kessler of this season, and not Walker Kessler, but when you do fantasy translations and you look at it all, and for this year, it was basically like, oh, well, this guy translates the best and he's projected third. This guy, third fantasy, third in real life, fourth fantasy, fifth in real life, whatever. And you go, oh, at projected 20th, but he's eighth. And that's Derek Lively. Huge block numbers, huge field goal percentage, incredibly low usage player, but one of those guys that can thrive in category league fantasy because he's a three category player. Blocks, rebounds, field goal percentage. He's 7-1. The Warriors probably need some help there apart from Kevon Looney. He knows his role. I'm not there to score, my guys. I'm there to rebound and defend and protect the rim. I think it would make a ton of sense. The next one is the Rockets again at pick number 20. And this one, I've seen this guy rise up a lot lately. I've seen him fall a lot. There's a huge range of guys, and I think he's going to move quite a bit on my board, and that's Bilal Kulabali. Or Kulabali. From Metropolitan's 92, a wing, 6'6". He's 18. He's got some shooting concerns, but he's really athletic. He can finish. His numbers playing for the junior team for Metropolitan's were absurd. Defensively, passing, scoring, efficiency was all through the roof. But then by the end of the year, he started playing big minutes next to Victor Wembanyama in their number one team. Just an athletic wing. I don't know whether he would come over straight away. He might stay in France for one more season. But just getting... Another wing size player who can be a wing defender at the three, can play a little bit at the two. It's that, and there's so many of these guys, but that sort of archetype of player, if it hits, is just hyper valuable. At 21, a lot of people have this guy in the lottery. I don't. It's Jordan Hawkins. Got him at 21 to the Nets. He's the oldest player we've looked at so far. 21 years of age. Gets the shine of the national championship for sure. We put up great numbers and led that team. Great shooting, 39% from three, 20 points per game. He's got a range of 10 to 25. He's six foot five. He's going to be able to help teams. And yeah, for a team with Joe Harris and Seth Curry on the older side and a team lacking guards and it's all filled with wings, then, then it makes sense here. But I think the older nature of what he is, considering nearly every other player is 19, he's 21, so it's a year and a half difference to most of these guys. The lack of what else can you do is, is a worry there. Defensively, what else can you do? Can you dribble? Can you finish? Can you do anything? Or are you just a bit of a one-dimensional player? And I fear that once we remove ourselves from the NCAA tournament and the finals and the final four run, when we look at Hawkins and we saw how good he was, and that movement shooting is awesome, but the prospect, the overall package is probably a little bit lacking. And the fact that he did all of this in this year at age 21, when if he had, a, you know, he could have potentially come out last year in a much weaker draft, um, but didn't because he wasn't quite there. That's always a marginal red flag. But in the 20s, you don't really care that much. 
The Nets have got back-to-backs. They're going to go pick 22 here. They're going to go to the G League Ignite, the third Ignite player in my mock draft. That's CD Sissoko. I said, listen to him as a shooting guard. He's probably more of a small forward. He's a wing. Six for five, 19 again. Big range of his um, draft, 18 to 38. Shooting is, is a concern, but he's athletic. He can pass. Like so many of these guys, he can defend. Good steals, good block rate. The shooting is a worry though. 44, 31, 64 from the field, from three and from the line is a real problem. But a lot of his markers, his assist numbers, his steal numbers, his block numbers, his three-point volume equates to, mm, maybe this guy is an elite prospect. And I said there was 18 top 10 players. I, I still believe that. But you see the night. Okay, see another one? Like if he ended up a top 10 player out of this class, I wouldn't be shocked. Also, I wouldn't be shocked if he was the 35th best player. But there's enough there in a passing wing who's not afraid to shoot, even though he can't, and can defend, and it's got size and length. These are just the unbelievably important type of players in the NBA. The next guy, not I don't rate him anywhere near as highly, and that's Maxwell Lewis going to the Blazers at pick 23, a wing from Pepperdine. He's a little bit older. He's going to be 21 soon. 6'7", sh- decent enough shooter. High usage guy for Pepperdine, but that, that is Pepperdine. So you know, the usage, we need to, to bear that in mind with the team he is on. I don't really see any argument for him being a lottery player or anything like that. And no one in my uh, database has picked him higher than 20. Just a solid shooter, bit part rotation guy. I don't even necessarily see long-term starter upside. All these guys could be starters for two to three years for sure. But when you want to pencil a guy in for an eight-year, nine-year starter, I don't know that I see that with Lewis, but that's the point in the draft that we're at here. And a pick 24, am I doing it because it's funny? A little bit, but I also believe this is the right spot for him. A pick 24 to the Sacramento Kings, it's Chris Murray. Obviously, the twin brother of Keegan Murray. Didn't shoot as well as Keegan, 34% from three overall. I think he was pretty good on his catch and shoot threes. But 20 points per game, 57 true shooting, 27 usage. I've seen him go as high as 10 in drafts, which is way too high. But he is old. He's 23. He's obviously the same age as Keegan Murray. He was old last year, and Chris is a year older coming into the league. But with Harrison Barnes maybe on the way out, with forward depth low behind them, Chris and Keegan back together. Could they start together in the future? Yeah, 100% they could. Size, some defensive positional ability, some scoring, some shooting. I don't love him as a player. I don't love his upside at all. I think he's a worse player than Keegan, but I think there is a solid floor here. But I also know that if he was in last year's draft, he would have gone in the top 15. I feel I feel pretty comfortable with that. I don't know why he didn't, to be honest. This is another one where I've got him at 25 and I look at him and go... Why couldn't he be a top 12 player? And that's Jalen hood Shafino from Indiana. You want to hear a pattern? He's a ball handler who's a guard who's big. Six foot six, point guard, 20 years of age. Well, not quite 20, almost there. He averaged four assists. He shot 33 from three. Shooting's a little bit off, but a high usage player who's big, who's tall, who can handle, who I think can defend okay. Tall ball handlers, man. They can be really, really useful. No, I've got him at 25 to the Grizzlies here. And I am very much, like I look at Maxwell Lewis, I go, yeah, I'm probably not moving you from there. And in hindsight, I think I'd probably end up moving Hood Shafino ahead of Maxwell Lewis pretty easily. And he could easily jump ahead of Sissoko. I could have him at 15 ahead of Leonard Miller, I reckon, Hood Shafino. But I've got him at 25 at the moment. I'm a little worried about the shooting. But the size is intriguing. The ball handling is intriguing. Jet Howard at 26. John Howard's son. Another guard from Michigan. He's still not 20. He's six foot eight. He can shoot. Really well from three, but like Jordan Hawkins, a little bit like Grady Dick, I don't know what else he does. And that pushes him down. Now, people have got him pretty high, 11. Some people have got him. I don't really buy that. I'm going to look into it a little bit more and talk to some people about him coming up. Um, I don't really buy it, him being that high of a player, because I just don't know what else he's doing apart from shooting. Which shooting is valuable, clearly, but I'm not 100% certain on him. 27, we're going to go to the Charlotte Hornets. And I'm going to go down to the Australian NBL and choose Rayan Rupert, French wing, who's, guess what, 18, 19 soon. A wing, six foot six with a range of 16 to 31. Didn't shoot very well in Australia. That's pretty common, playing against men. 48 true shooting, 31% from three. But 20 usage, 13.6 uh, 13. points per 36 minutes. One and a half steals, five rebounds. Just a interesting connector sort of player who probably doesn't have starter upside. But is he on the same level of prospect as Usman Jeng? Probably. They both played for the Breakers, French guys in the NBL. So I guess there's an easy correlation to move there. 
but Rupert could very easily be a top 20 player. At pick 28, it is the Utah Jazz. I'm going to go with James Naji, big man from Barcelona. He's, guess what? 18. Yeah, he's 6 foot 10. Some people got him in the 50s. Makes no sense to me. There's no way I'd let him slide outside the top 35. Do the Jazz need another center? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They've got Walker Kessler there. But at pick 28, what are you looking at? Like, are you just taking swings on upside? Some of the case. And I can easily see the case for the guy who got a pick 29 going ahead of him. And I think we're going to look a lot more into pick 29 really soon. Um, but I just think Najee's just strong. Like, just having 48 minutes of capable center play yeah, around Larry Markinen, great rim protection the whole time, trade assets as well. And you probably don't need to bring him over necessarily. He can stay in Barcelona at age 18 for another year or two. And that becomes another tra- trade ship. So James Nagy at 28. At 29, Bobby Clintman, who averaged nine points per 36 minutes. That's uh, not very good. Five points a game he averaged at Wake Forest. He shot 37% from three, 53 true shooting, 15 usage. Some people have him undrafted on their list. The highest is 15. I saw Kevin O'Connor update his mock draft at the ringer, had him at 15. He's six foot 10. First person I saw really talk about this guy was Adam Spinella from the Box and One, who jumped him up to 20 something. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. He is from Sweden. He dominates the Swedish national team. And hearing someone, I, remember, I think it was on No Ceilings talking about him the other day, talking about how he's moved around and trying to fit into different positions. But we talk about Taylor Hendricks, a 6'10 forward, 6'9 forward who can shoot, who can defend, who can rebound, who's positionally aware. He just didn't have those opportunities to get the ball in his hands as much. The upside for him is interesting. He's on a little bit of the Jalen Williams Santa Clara trajectory of, oh, who's this guy? I've never heard of him. And now he's pushing way up. And the part of the reason I kind of put him at 15 is intel that someone's going to pick him there. And there is thoughts that maybe he might shut down his workouts. Now, he might not even stay in the draft. He might go G League Ignite or he might go back to college. I don't know. But he's a really intriguing player. And then pick 30, last one in this mock draft, the Clippers at pick 30 had, or going to take, in my opinion here at this spot, to Quavion Smith, NC State. Now, Smith is a guy that I would have picked in the 20s last year. He went back to school. And he shot really badly, under 50% true shooting. He had 30 usage average, 19 points, four and a half assists. He's got a little bit to me of the Bones Highlands about him. You might think that's good or bad, I don't know. But he's a 6'4", 20-year-old shooting guard with some shooting upside, with some scoring upside. Just adding another guy into the mix there. He's probably not going to play much for the Clippers in this scenario. But there are a bunch of other guys I could very easily see who could jump into this position um, and, yeah, and be useful enough at pick. 30 in the NBA draft. So that is my first mock draft. The Spurs, congratulations. Weminyama. The Hornets, congratulations. Pick number two. The Pistons, commiserations, dropping to five. The Blazers, congratulations on trading Anthony Simons and getting someone else in. Well done. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you're on YouTube, thumb it up. And leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.